worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. Our God, He holds the victory.
in a series uh, on how you can live a more joyful, a more joyful life. And what we've been looking at is that a joyful life begins in your mind, right? Begins in your mind. The Apostle Paul, we've been looking at the book of Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, Paul writes a lot about the mind of a Christian. Because a joyful life starts in your mind. My manner of life, your manner of life, is a reflection of what occupies your mind. Amen. Whatever is in your mind, whatever you focus on, whatever you think about, Amen. plays out as far as your whole life. For the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this, and, and if you guys will remember, it'll be on the screen, that my feelings always follow my focus. Mm -hmm. Your feelings always follow your, fo your focus. Think about your week and, and the emotions that you've had, the things that you've been focusing on. And you will see that they're connected to the actual feelings, the emotions, mm -hmm. your, how you've been throughout this week. I've, I've been anxious. I've been, I've been fearful. I've been worried. I've been, I've been happy. It's all about what you focus on. So today my message is entitled Opportunity. Opportunity. And I, I want to start with a story that I've heard. Uh, that I heard. It, it, it's something that happened a long, long time ago. Um, it's a story about a, a little boy that um, uh, went with his mother to to one of those those old general stores right, back in back in the day. And whenever he would go to the store to the general store with his mom, with his mom, he would sneak away from his mom. And, and when no one was looking, he would dip his finger in the big barrel of molasses <laughs> and taste, taste the molasses while no one was looking. Well, one day, he goes with his mom, and he's over there dipping, and, and the storekeeper sees him and decides he's going to teach this little boy a lesson. So he goes over to him, picks him up by his bridges, dunks him head first in the barrel of molasses and then takes him out and sits him down um, on the front porch of the, of the store. Well, instead of crying, the little boy is out there and he's praying. He says, God, give me the tongue to equal this opportunity. <laughs> And that story reminds me that everyone's idea of an opportunity is different based on who they are and what's important to them. For some of you, getting your head dumped in a bat of molasses might be a good thing. Not me personally. <laughs> But everyone's idea of an opportunity is different based on who you are and, and what's important to you. Perhaps that's why Thomas Edison, um, he once said that opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. <laughs> and it's true because Often opportunity comes during difficult circumstances. Sometimes the greatest opportunities come in the most difficult situations, the most difficult circumstances. So today what we want to look at is Paul writes to help us understand, help us to learn how to not miss opportunities when they come our way, even when the situations are difficult for us. So our text is Philippians chapter 1. 
We're going to read verses 12 through 14. We're going to focus on that today. Um, gosh, there's so much in Philippians chapter 1. Um, but I don't want to keep you here all afternoon. So. so we're going to focus on verses 12 through 14 from Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes this. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So, Paul's writing to the Philippian church that he had started 10 years previously. Paul's in Rome and he's in prison. He's um, under uh, the palace guard. And so Paul is obviously writing and responding here in this passage to what he's been hearing from his friends in the Philippian church. They've, um, he's read their letters to him. They've been, um, they've been sending people to Rome to visit him, to, to help to care for him and, and give him things, give him messages, give him updates. So these, these are the things that are going on back home, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they're obviously concerned about him because he's imprisoned in Rome. So Paul wants to teach them and wants to teach us how he's able to be joyful in the midst of his circumstances. This is the focus. This is what he's attempting to do. Okay? So, now, Paul is literally in chains. But for us, chains are circumstances. Chains are circumstances, either positive or negative circumstances that we feel restrict us or hold us back. All of us have experienced the feeling of being chained. Because we've all experienced circumstances, either negative or positive, that we feel restrict us or hold us back. You know you're chained to something when you feel like you can't break free. When you can only go so far, and then something jerks you back to where you started. Everybody has felt that way. Circumstances. Chains. How about money problems? Debt. Bad credit. <coughs> Unexpected bills. Your car breaks down. It's five thousand dollars to fix it. Your your plumbing goes out in your house. You come back from a vacation and your house is full. Your floor is full of water. Your water heater blew up. Whoa! How about you get laid off from work? How about health problems? I can't do the things that I used to be able to do that were so easy. Now I can't even do them. Marriage, family problems, divorce, custody battles, addictions. How about the positive? circumstances. 
you get promoted. But now, you got to work more hours. you got less free time. How about when you have kids? That's a positive. But your free time just left the room. <laughs> your, me, your me time is gone, man. Chance. Paul, for many, many, many years, had wanted to go to Rome as a preacher. He had talked about it often. He's written about it, even in the Word. He's written about it. It must have been a dream for him. Now he's in his 70s. And he gets to go to Rome, but not as a preacher, as a prisoner. His friends must have felt bad for him. They probably felt sorry for him. He had worked so hard, sacrificed so much. They probably thought, oh man, Paul is a good man. He doesn't deserve this. This isn't fair. He must be devastated. This is horrible. It was a tough situation. And it, and it didn't seem fair. Any of you ever been there? Yeah. Tough situation. It doesn't seem fair. I know I, I have. Some of you guys that, that know me, you know that my mom contracted a, an incurable muscle disease when I was a teenager. And she finally she passed away when I was in my early 20s. She, my mom was only 41 when she passed away. What you may not know is that maybe three or four years after that, my younger brother committed suicide. He shot himself using my dad's gun that he kept in his house. He shot himself in, in my dad's house. My, my baby sister was in the house alone that day. The local newspaper has a picture of my sister sitting on the curb outside of my house crying after that happened. He was 21. That happened three years after my mom died. A year. A year, a year and a half later, my dad had a heart attack and died suddenly. His heart was probably, had never recovered from my mom passing away and his son committing suicide in his house using his gun. So I lost the majority of my family in, a, in about a five year period. Tough situation. Doesn't seem fair. You have your stories. I have my story. No one's life is perfect. But Paul seems to address those that were feeling sorry for him. Those that viewed his situation as it must be the end of his dreams. It must be the end of his goal, his goals in life. And we see it in verse 12. Let's go back to verse 12. He says, now 
I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Amen. The word advance here in the Greek is actually an old military term called pioneer advance. A pioneer advance was when the engineers would cut down trees in front of the army in order to, to, to clear a path for them to be able to advance against an obstacle. That's a pioneer advance. That's the term that Paul uses here. So Paul's attitude in verse 12 was, hey y'all, don't be, don't be bummed out. Don't feel sorry for me. Man, I'm blazing a trail. I'm blazing a trail. I'm taking the gospel where no one has ever been able to take it. Amen. I've stumbled upon a once in a lifetime opportunity. That was his approach. That's his attitude in verse 12. Now, how was he able to think like this? How was he able to see opportunity when everyone else saw chains? How was he able to see and speak the positive in, this, in the situation that he was in when everyone else saw and spoke the negative? How was he able to see opportunity when everyone else was hard? I see two things right away. And these are the two things I want you to see. Number one, he knew what God is really like. He knew what God is, is really like. Let me explain. Paul grew up believing in God. My guess, my assumption, is that everyone in the room here believes in God. That's what Paul grew up believing in God. He studied the scriptures. He learned the history of Israel. All of that. But it wasn't until he was on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9 that he met Jesus. Now it becomes personal. He meets Jesus on the Damascus Road. And that was when he began to learn what God is really like. And it changed him forever. Because when you meet Jesus and you begin to learn what God is, what he's really like, it changes Amen. your life forever. Amen. It changed him. One important thing that he learned about God, and this is so important for us to learn about God, was about the divine goodness of God. The divine goodness of God. Remember, Paul had basically been a bounty hunter. He, he was a bounty hunter that rounded up Christians that were then jailed, and some of them were even executed because he rounded them up. So their blood was on him. The suffering all that, all that, neck, all that horrible stuff that happened to those people were, was on him because he rounded them up. He, they would break into people's houses and drag them out of their house if they were Christians at that time, much like in other parts of the world today. 
So he was a bounty hunter. But I want you to listen to what he says after experiencing the love, the forgiveness, the goodness of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 15, verses 15 through 16, he says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He didn't forget who he was and what he did. Of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. What an amazing thing. And the only way he could come to that conclusion was that he experienced God's patience, love, forgiveness, and goodness. It was real. It wasn't just something that he read about, something that he heard rumors about. He experienced it because he knew who he was and he knew what God did for him in spite of that. He said, I'm the worst. So if God could do this for me, he could do this for anybody. He was the example. We need to understand, and this is what Paul understood, all, let me hear you say all, all, all of the blessings of God, all the blessings of God, the sunshine, the air we breathe, the food you eat, the people that, are, are, that, are, that you love that are part of you, every blessing of God flows from the goodness of God. Every, all blessings flow from that source, God's goodness. If it wasn't for God's goodness, there would be no blessing. There would be no life. There would be nothing. Everything flows from the goodness of God. So faith in God, or is faith or confidence in the goodness of God? that we're confident, we know God is good. And we're confident in that. That's what faith is. God is loving and patient and kind and all he wants for me 24-7 is good. Is good things. 24-7. 24-7, all God wants for you is good things. Right now, even as we speak, God is like, man, I want good things to happen to you. I want good things to happen to you. I want good things to happen to you. I want good things to happen to you today. I want good things to happen to you tomorrow. I want good things to happen to you. I want good things to happen for you. That's 24-7. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if you go outside and you got a flat tire. God is still like, man, I want good things to happen for you right. out of this. Yeah. Something good is going to happen out of this flat tire. Yeah. I want you to ponder this thought that I want you to see. This is a thought positive from A.W. Tozer. He writes, the whole outlook of mankind might be changed if we could all believe that we dwell under a friendly sky. 
and that the God of heaven, though exalted in power and majesty, is eager to be friends with us. Everything about the world would change. I'm so exhausted with waking up every morning, every, every morning, I wake up, I pull my phone, I look at my phone, and there's notification after notification. This person was killed for this. This shooting happened here. This happened here. It, every day. Not a day goes by that my phone isn't just notification, notification, notification. It's just amazing. But everything would be different if we, if everyone really would just believe that God wants good things for everyone. said during worship, I want to I want to commend you for being in church. Amen. Because this is where you learn about God's goodness. This is where you learn what God is really like. And that's the most important thing there is in life. Is to, is to learn who God is and what he's really like. Paul understood this. He knew God. He knew what God was like. He knew, he understood about the goodness of God. It started on that day on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. He knew what God was really like. You see, the more we learn about what God is really like, the more joyful our life will be. You if, do you, if you struggle with joy, if you struggle, if, 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 if it's just negative, 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 I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, the country, the nation, the this, the politics, the whatever, you aren't focused on the goodness of God. The more you learn about who God is, it is and what he's like, the more joyful your life will be. So that's number one. The second thing that I see with how Paul was able to have this attitude goes along with this. He knew how to walk with God. He not only knew what God is really like, but then he knew how to walk with God. He knew how to walk with him. So let's, let's talk about this. Before, and I've taught, I've taught this before, but this is really important because this is a key. Before God created man, he created an, an amazing, beautiful place for mankind to live, for Adam and Eve to live, right? We refer to it as the garden. Genesis 2 verse 9 says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for food. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Four essentials in the garden, correct? Though the garden was actually more like a grove of trees, okay? And the, this garden...
garden, this grove of trees, contains four things that I just mentioned. Um, beauty, sustenance, life, and knowledge are the four elements of this garden. Remember? Beauty, sustenance, life, knowledge, pleasing to the eye, good for food, tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? The garden is where it was, it was, it was created to provide the basic needs of all people. Are all the, these four things, we all need these four things. It's just the way we're, we're created. Our need for beauty, our need for physical nourishment, relationship with him, and an understanding of how to live. We all need those four things. Basic needs. The garden was a place of purpose. It was where Adam and Eve would, would learn how, what their, what their purpose of, of their lives were. It, it would give them direction and guidance. And that came from their worship and obedience of God. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and the woman and put, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Hebrew words for work it and take care of it are the same exact words used to describe the worship of the priests in the temple and the tabernacle. So, we're, we're, so what we see is that Adam and Eve were put in the garden to be priests, to learn to, to, learn to worship and obey God, to serve God, to be ministers to God. That was that was how they would develop their purpose in life. I need y'all to hear me. Your purpose, your direction for your life comes when you worship God and you obey God. That's worship. That's ministry. That's how you develop your purpose. You don't have to go through life lost. Your purpose in life isn't your career. Your purpose in life, you were created to worship and to obey God, Amen. to be a priest, man or woman. You're, 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 you're here to, to learn how to serve God. And in that process, you figure out what you're supposed to do with your life. Now, here's the thing. That was the original intent. That's the garden, right? But for Paul and for you and I, our garden, what we what we what we refer to as the garden is now called the kingdom of God. We don't call it the garden. There is no physical place that we go to now. There's no grove of trees that we go to to, 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 to access all this. Now, it's spiritual. Now, it's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the same exact thing as the garden. Yeah. It's in the kingdom that all the four basic needs that we that we have are there. Beauty, sustenance, life, knowledge. Now we can access the kingdom of God and be in and in, in, in access all those four things. It's in the kingdom that we can connect with God and get everything that we need for life. And it's in the kingdom that we discover our purpose for life. 
Now, here's how we access the kingdom. Because I believe everybody here wants to be in the garden. Amen? Amen? Amen. It's like, give me the map to the garden. <laughs> Show me how to get to the garden. Kingdom, garden, whatever, call it whatever you want. So for some of you, it may help you to think of it that way. Because it's the same thing. That's why Jesus came. You read about when Jesus' first ministry first started. He said, the kingdom of God is now here. Right. He's talking about the garden. Yeah. He's saying, now everybody has access <laughs> to that place. So how do we get in? How do we get to this? How do we access the kingdom, the garden? It's only after we submit to God's will that the provision of the kingdom becomes manifest in our lives. You access the kingdom by submitting to God's will because the kingdom of God is God's will. You can't separate the two. You have to submit yourself, your will to his will. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Isn't it amazing that it doesn't say, Thy kingdom come, my will. <laughs> my will be done. That's how most people try to do it. And then they wonder why. They just keep bumping up. I can't seem to get in to, yeah, that ain't, that ain't how you get in. It's only after you say to God, whatever you want, I want. It ain't a no holy grail, there's no place you have to go, some special place in the world. It ain't, it ain't about Indiana Jones. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an old-fashioned word called humility. Amen. It's called surrender. Amen. You're humble enough to go whatever you Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to give, <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, whatever it takes. You know what I mean? You may you may have to cry a little bit. <laughs> Have to give up everything. But that's the only way into the kingdom. That's how you get in the garden. That's how you walk with God. <coughs> only way to live in God's kingdom, in his garden, and have access to everything that he provides is to surrender your will to his will. Amen. Your wants to his wants. Your way to his way. Amen. Paul understood this. Paul was focused on helping people discover who Jesus is. 
Because when you read in Acts chapter 9, when he has this encounter with Jesus, the first thing he says is, Lord, what do you want me to do? And Jesus obviously told him, this is what I want. And for the rest of his life, that's what Paul did. He did what Jesus told him. This is what I want you to do. From now on, your life is going to go in this direction. He was like, I'm good with that. So he was focused on helping people discover who Jesus is. He wanted to share the gospel. He wanted to share the good news, the message that now everyone has access to the kingdom of God, the garden of God through Jesus Christ. Paul wanted everyone to hear about Jesus because that's what Jesus told him, this is what I want you to do. So when he was initially brought to Rome, for I'm not sure exactly how long the time it was, but when he was initially brought to Rome, he was under house arrest. So he was able to live in his house but he was chained to a Roman guard 24-7. They would work six-hour shifts. Every six hours, another guard would come. During that time, these, now think about this, these were the elite soldier, Roman soldiers. These were Caesar's palace guard soldiers. He was like chained to the Navy, like the Navy SEALs every, every six hours, 24-7 in his house, okay? But think about it. They got to hear every conversation he had. They got to hear every prayer that he prayed. They got to listen to all the letters he dictated to be sent to all the churches. They probably heard his letter to the Philippians. They were probably there when he, when he was dictating this letter. Okay, tell them this, we'll about to say that. Imagine the impact. These are, these are Caesar's personal guard. They're asking him questions. They're, talk, they're having conversations with him about God, about Jesus, about salvation. We know later on in the book of Acts that because of, because of what was going on, even Caesar's household heard about the gospel. The impact where everybody else was like, oh, this is so horrible. We're so, we feel so bad about you. And he was like, y'all don't understand. I'm telling everybody about Jesus. I'm doing exactly what God told me to do. What an amazing situation for him that he was in. Now, Let's go back and read verses 12 through 14 again. Now that you have this different understanding of his situation, it makes so much more sense when you read his passage with understanding. Starting at verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance, to pioneer advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Yeah. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I'm preaching the gospel to the elite palace guard, the scariest dudes on the planet. And if I can do that, everybody else is like, well, if he can do that, shoot, I'm going to talk to other people about Jesus too. Because I don't have to be afraid. I'm confident in the goodness of God. And I know how to walk with God. You know,
know it's easy. It is so easy to focus on our feelings. It doesn't take any skill. It doesn't take any talent. It doesn't take any courage. It doesn't take any effort to focus on your feelings. Super easy. When we come out of the womb, all we focus on is our feelings. <laughs> Unfortunately, some people don't seem to progress <laughs> beyond that. Because it's just so easy. It's like being a critic. It doesn't take any ability to be a critic. It doesn't take any talent. Anybody can be. And, and we all are. But Paul could be joyful because he focused on helping others hear about Jesus. He was fully surrendered to God's goodness and operating in the power and the blessing that comes when you walk with God in the garden. Think about it. The Romans intended those chains to bind Paul, but God used those chains to free Paul to be able to say whatever he needed to say to, and to spread the gospel to the elite levels of government in the city of Rome. So what about what about you? Have you let yourself feel sorry for yourself about your circumstances, your past, things that have happened to you, situations, tough situations that don't seem fair? God may want to use those exact situations for something great. Focus your life on learning what God is really like. And then submit to his will. Then you'll see your circumstances as opportunities. The very things that have, that have been so difficult for you could end up being the way that God uses to pioneer advance the gospel, to open the way for someone else to hear about the goodness of God. That's what Paul did. That's what I did. That's what millions of people around the world are doing right now. Instead of complaining and feeling sorry for ourselves, we're asking God to use our circumstances, the thing, the tough situations that have happened in our lives to pioneer advance the gospel. I believe with all my heart I wouldn't be here I wouldn't be here sharing this with you today if I hadn't have gone through the things that I've gone through. Rejoice at what God is going to do instead of complaining about what God didn't do. Let me say it one more time. Rejoice. Let me hear you say rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice at what God is going to do instead of complaining.
about what God didn't do. Focus on what the fact that God is good and he's going to do good things for you. It's coming. Be confident in the goodness of God. Amen. I want to encourage all of you that are watching to continue to give faithfully to Celebration Church. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Of course, you can mail mail uh, mail it in or drop by our location, which is 990 Meadowgate Road in Meta Vista, uh, California, 95722. You can give online a couple of different ways. You, know, you can always use PayPal. And use the PayPal address of one celebration at sbcglobal.net or you can go to our our website our church website which is www.ccfellowship.org go to the home page go up to the about us uh, tab pull that down and go to the to give now and then there's a donate button that'll take you to our online giving page and uh, text giving is available as well. That's our, it's probably the fastest way to give to our church. And that is you text the word give, text the word give to area code 530-288-4500. And you can uh, give your tithe and offering uh, to, to celebration that way as well. And always, if you're watching on our YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office, Subscribe and click like. We're so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to Christ or want to reach out to us in any way, please email us at celebrationchurch13 at gmail.com. To purchase Lou Ann Lee worship CDs and songbooks, click the links below. God bless you.